Our speaker is from some university with a G. Um, and you could just point out that uh, this is also the logo of Georgetown University, and also the University of Georgia, so one of those two places. That's right. Paul Pollock, uh, Arithmetic Functions, Old and New. Okay, well, thank you for being here, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak. So I'm gonna be talking about some questions on arithmetic functions that are motivated by the fascination that uh, the ancients had with summing divisors. So I wanna begin by just setting a little bit of notation. So there will be two sum of divisors functions that feature in this talk. So there's maybe the more familiar one, sigma of n. This is just what you get by summing all of the divisors of n. But for much of this talk, I'll state results in terms of this closely related function s of n, which is the same except I don't include n itself in the sum. So sigma of n and s of n are related by s of n being sigma of n minus n. So s of four is three, sigma of four is seven. And now there are two definitions that I wanna make which go back uh, more than 2,000 years. So there's the definition of a perfect number. A perfect number is a number n with s of n equaling n. And there's the definition of an amicable number. So an amicable number is a number n where s of n is not equal to n, but if you apply s twice, then you do get back to n. So an amicable number, you can think of it as, well, if you start applying s to a number n repeatedly, it's a number which generates a two cycle under that process. So that's what an amicable number is. So just as a couple of examples, s of six is six, so six is perfect. And then, well, if you want an amicable number, the smallest example is 220. So S of 220 is 284. You apply S one more time to 284, you get back to 220. Okay, so I wanna give you a flavor of some of what the ancients wrote about these numbers. So Iamblichus, writing around 300 AD, discusses the number six. He says it was said to be perfect. It was called marriage by the Pythagoreans. It was called holy and represents beauty because of the richness of its proportions. So this is a very well-proportioned number, the number six. And then Augustine, writing not much later, also discusses the number six. He says six is a number perfect in itself, not because God created all things in six days, rather the converse is true. <laughs> God created all things in six days because the number is perfect. Okay, so there's a couple of thoughts about the perfect number six. Here are some thoughts about 220 and 284. So Pythagoras, was around in the sixth century BCE, allegedly when he was asked what a friend was, said a friend is one who is the other eye. Well, so far so good, it's kind of beautiful. And then as an example, he gives 220 and 284. <laughs> so Ibn Khaldun, much later, uh, is also writing about amicable numbers and he says, 220 and 284 have an influence to establish a union or close friendship between two individuals. So this explains the name amicable right there. They're related to friendship. Al-Madridi, writing a few centuries earlier, took this a little further. <laughs> he himself claims to have tested the erotic effect of giving someone the smaller number 220 to eat and himself eating the larger number 284. So, okay. So <laughs> my own feeling about this is summed up uh, in the following quote. So we tend to scoff at the beliefs of the ancients, but we can't scoff at them personally to their faces. And this is what annoys me. Okay. So this is a quote from Jack Handy, who is a writer for Saturday Night Live around 20 years ago. Okay, so let's start talking about some mathematics. So Whenever you have an interesting set of numbers, as an analytic number theorist, one thing you ask is, can we count? So what can we say about the distribution of those sets of numbers? So I've talked about the perfect numbers, I've talked about the amicable numbers, you could ask this question for either of them. For the sake of time, I'm only going to say a bit about what's known for the distribution of amicable numbers. So I will say this is one of those situations where we don't know any lower bound that goes to infinity. So we can't even prove that there are infinitely many amicable numbers. Though there are methods for constructing them that go back a ways, so Euler was very interested in this question. He constructed uh, dozens of pairs of amicable numbers, and now using a computer, there are more than 10 million amicable pairs that have been constructed, but we still don't have a proof that there are infinitely many. 
But you could ask in the other direction, can you at least prove there aren't too many? So let me let V2 of x just count the number of amicable numbers up to x, so this is just the counting function of the set. Then the first significant theorem in this direction was due to Erdős in 55. He proved that V2 of x is little o of x as x goes to infinity. In other words, almost all numbers in the sense of asymptotic density are not amicable. Okay, this is somewhat old news. It's more than 60 years old now. I'll just mention the state of the art result, which is actually uh, this. So the number of amicable numbers up to x is actually smaller than about x over e to the root log x. So that's the best upper bound we have right now. It's actually, a, there's a slightly sharper result which is a little harder to state, but I won't, I won't go into that now. Okay, so I want to actually say a bit about how Erdős proved his theorem because it connects with the, the work, the new work that I want to talk about later in the talk. So let me, let me discuss how Erdős proved this theorem that almost all numbers are not amicable. Okay, so there are two legs to this proof and I'll spend some time talking about both of the legs. So the first is the following proposition. So I'll just state it and then maybe I'll explain a little bit about what it means because it looks a little funny. So let epsilon be greater than zero. Then for almost all numbers n, meaning all numbers n apart from a set of density zero, s of s of n over s of n is bigger than s of n over n minus epsilon. Okay, how should you think of this? Well, let me give a name to this function s of n over n. I'm gonna call that the abundancy of the number. And this term is motivated by another ancient definition uh, the ancients called the number abundant if s of n over n was bigger than one. So I'm just gonna call the abundancy of a number s of n over n. Then this proposition says that almost all of the time, the abundancy of s of n, which is what you have on the left, is at least approximately the same as the abundancy of n. Okay, so the abundancy doesn't tend to go down very much as you apply s. Okay. So how did Erdős prove this? Well, the key insight is to notice that this, this function s of n over n, which I'll denote here f of n, is essentially determined by small divisors. So let me first of all discuss how we can make sense of that claim. So it's an elementary exercise to rewrite s of n over n in the following way. It actually can be expressed as a reciprocal sum. So it's the sum of the divisors of n which are greater than one. The greater than one here corresponds to the fact that I'm just looking at proper divisors. So this is s of n over n, this is an alternative representation. And then once you have this representation, there's a natural way to define a, a related function which only is sensitive to small divisors. Namely, I take exactly the same sum I already have, but I restrict the d now to be less than or equal to y. So I'll call that the y truncated abundancy function. So I have abundancy and I have y truncated abundancy. And it's trivial that the abundancy is always at least the y truncated abundancy just because I have more terms in in the actual sum than in the truncated sum. On the other hand, it's also easy to prove that the abundancy and the y truncated abundancy don't differ too much on the average. So I won't read through this calculation, but if you'd like, you can do it yourself, but it's easy to prove that if you add up the difference between f of n and f y of n over n up to x, you get something that's big O of x, of x over y. So basically what you're getting is x times something that looks like the sum of the reciprocals of the squares past y. And what this is saying is that on average, f of n and the truncated version differ by just big O of one over y. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind and now we'll think of y as large and fixed in a way I'm going to specify momentarily. So I'm gonna fix a, a large y. And now I want to use what I just said about f of n being related to f y of n in the following way. I'm going to show that actually the number n and the number s of n, almost all of the time they have exactly the same set of divisors up to y. So for almost all n, n and s of n actually share exactly the same set of divisors less than or equal to y. Okay, that sounds a, a little bit strange the first time you see it, but I can hopefully convince you why it should be true. So how can I guarantee that n and s of n should share the same set of divisors up to y? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to guarantee something that looks a little bit strange. I'm going to guarantee that sigma of n is a multiple of d for every d up to y. I'm gonna force that to be true. If I force that to be true, then if you look at this definition of s of n, s of n is sigma of n mi minus n. If I take that modulo d for some d up to y, then, well, I'm assuming sigma of n is zero, so s of n is minus n mod d, and so one side of that congruence is zero if and only if the other is. So s of n and n are both either divisible by d or both not divisible by d. 
So if I ensure that sigma of n is divisible by d for every d up to y, then I do get that s of n and n share the same set of divisors up to y. But how can I ensure that sigma of n is divisible by d for every d up to y? Well, that's the same as saying sigma of n is divisible by m, where m is the least common multiple of the numbers one through y. Why should that be true? Well, actually, that is true almost all of the time. So this is maybe an initially surprising fact. Take any fixed number, capital M you like, doesn't have to be this M, though it could be this M, then sigma of N is almost always divisible by capital N. Why is that true? Well, it actually is an easy application of any upper bound sieve you like. So any upper bound sieve you like will prove that almost all of the time, there is a prime in the residue class negative one mod M that appears to exactly the first power in the prime factorization of little n. And once you have such a prime, then, well, when you compute sigma of n, you'll get out a factor of p plus one. And then, well, because p was in this residue class, p plus one will be a multiple of m. So you'll ensure that m divides sigma of n. Okay. So let's just collect where we're at right now. So we have now that n and s of n have the same set of divisors less than or equal to y for almost all n, for all n outside of a set of asymptotic density zero. And now let's see what this means about abundancy. Well, I look first at the truncated abundancy. The fact that n and s of n have the same set of divisors up to y means that the truncated abundancy of s of n is the same as the truncated abundancy of n because the truncated abundancy only sees the divisors up to y. And now if I go back to the actual abundancy of s of n, well, the actual abundancy of s of n is at least the truncated abundancy of s of n, which is just the truncated abundancy of n for all these n outside of a set of density zero. And now, well, the truncated abundancy of n and the actual abundancy differ by big O of one over y on average, and so I can replace f y of n with f of n minus epsilon. I get f y of n is greater than f of n minus epsilon as long as I avoid a set of upper density big O of epsilon inverse over y. Okay, so that's what I get from my, my uh, first moment estimate before. And so what have we done? Well, we've almost proved Erdős's result. We've shown, this argument shows that the abundancy of S of n is at least the abundancy of n minus epsilon away from a set of upper density big O of epsilon inverse over y. I wanted it away from a set of density zero, but y can be taken arbitrarily large. So I get, I get what I want. Okay, so this is the first lug of Erdős's proof. The abundancy of S of n is at least almost always as large as the abundancy of n almost always. <laughs> okay, so the second part of the proof relies on a nice theorem of Harold Davenport from 1933, which will again feature in uh, the later work discussed in this talk. So for every real number u at least zero, I'm gonna look at this set script d sub s of u. And the set is defined by just collecting all numbers n where s of n over n falls below the given number u. So that's all script d sub s of u is. Davenport's theorem is that this set always possesses an asymptotic density, which we'll just call normal D, normal D sub S of U. And moreover, if I consider this density as a function of U, then it's a continuous function of U. It's pretty easy to see that if you plug in zero, you get zero. In fact, S of N over N is only zero when N is one, and otherwise it's bigger. So D sub S of zero is the density of the singleton set one, which is zero. It's a little bit harder to see that d sub s of infinity is one, but he proved that. So d sub s infinity here just means the limit of d sub s of u as u goes to infinity. Okay, so this is a theorem of Davenport. And he was motivated by these old questions about abundant, deficient, and perfect numbers, but I won't go into the history right now. Okay, so Erdős uses this, and the key, key part of this theorem he uses is the fact that this is a continuous function of u. So we'll see why that's important in a second. Okay. So now I can tell you the second leg of Erdős's proof, which is the following theorem. So all abundant numbers n, remember abundant number just means a number n with s of n greater than n. All abundant numbers n, excluding a density zero set of exceptions, have s of n also being abundant. So s preserves abundancy almost always. Okay, so what's the proof? Well, being abundant means s of n over n is bigger than one. I actually want, for my purposes, I want it to be not just bigger than one, but sizably bigger than one. So I'm gonna fix a small number delta, and I'm going to start by just looking at numbers which satisfy the stronger condition, S of n over n bigger than one plus delta. 
I can do that if I'm willing to throw out the numbers n with s of n over n between one and one plus delta. Throwing those out means excluding a set of this density, where this d sub s is the distribution function we saw on the previous slide, Davenport's function. Okay, so let's assume I've done my throwing out process and I only have numbers now with s of n over n bigger than one plus delta. Well, by Erdős's proposition, all of the remaining n's, all of these n's with s of n over n greater than one plus delta, apart from a density zero set of exceptions, have s of s of n over s of n greater than, and I can put on the right, anything less than one plus delta. That's what Erdős tells me. So I'll put one plus delta over two. And then, well, you'll notice that that's greater than one, and so all of these n's have s of s of n over s of n greater than one. That means s of n is abundant. So what we've shown is that if n is abundant, then, well, either s of n is abundant, or you're in a density zero set, or you're in this set that we threw out at the very beginning, s of n over n between one and one plus delta. That set has the density written there, but what's the point? Well, the point is that I can take delta as small as I like in this argument, and I can use the fact that d sub s is continuous, and this density then shrinks down to zero. So if you just do that, then you get this theorem, that abundant numbers, apart from a density zero set of exceptions, are such that s of n is also abundant. Okay. And now finally, how does Erdős finish up the proof that the amicables have density zero? Well, the first thing is, it's certainly enough to just count the smaller members of an amicable pair, because if you count the larger members too, then the counting function at most doubles. So it's enough to show that the number of smaller members of an amicable pair up to x is little o of x. And now if you have the smaller member of an amicable pair, it's an abundant number, because you apply s to it, you jump to the larger member of the pair. But s of it is not abundant, because s of it is something where if you apply s again, you jump down to the smaller member. So you've jumped smaller, so you're actually deficient. So the smaller member of an amicable pair is a number which is abundant, but where s of n is not abundant, well, we just showed that those numbers have density zero. So actually, we've proven that the amicables have density zero by embedding them in the set of numbers which are abundant, but where s of them is not abundant, which is a set we also just showed has density zero. Okay. Okay, so, so far, this I don't think counts as a recent development in analytic number theory. This is a 60-year-old argument of Erdős. But I wanna talk about some recent developments which were, are motivated by thinking deeply about this argument. So, one of the key results in the proof I just told you is this proposition of Erdős. So the proposition is, okay, uh, almost all of the time the abundancy of S of N is at least about the abundancy of N. When you see something like this, you could ask, well, okay, this is an inequality in one direction. Is there a reverse inequality? Can you actually turn it around? So would it be true with a greater than replaced by less than when with the minus epsilon replaced by a plus epsilon? So can you do this Erdős argument in reverse somehow? And well, it's a natural question to ask. If you actually look at our proof, you might think that we've already done it. So why might you think that well, if you look at our proof, how did it go? So the proof, of it, proof went roughly like this. So we showed that f of n, that the abundancy is usually close to the truncated abundancy. And then we showed that almost all of the time, for any fixed y, the abundancy of n, the truncated abundancy of n is the same as the truncated abundancy of s of n, because n and s of n almost always have the same set of small divisors. And it looks like both of the statements I, I just said are symmetric in n and s of n, or it looks like certainly this is symmetric in n and s of n. And so if you can prove this, that the abundancy of s of n is usually at least as large as the abundancy of n roughly, then, well, it seems like you ought to be able to just use the same argument and prove this, just turn it around. But there's a subtle asymmetry here, and the asymmetry between n and s of n is that one of them has an s around them. <laughs> Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, the point is we know that f of n and f y of n are usually nearby if y is large, but that doesn't mean that f of n and f of s of n are usually nearby if y is large. Because we're still counting n's, we're not counting s of n. So uh, the, the idea is, okay, our proof shows that if f of s of n and f y of s of n are far apart, then s of n is forced into a small set. That's what the existing arguments we have show. But we really want n forced into a small set in order to do the proof. And so you're led to this question, if 
you place S of n in a small set, are you automatically placing n in a small set? So what's a rigorous way of formulating this? Well, you can make the following conjecture, which was actually made in a paper of Erdős, Granville, Pomerantz, and Spiro from 1990. If you take a set of, the po of positive integers with density zero, then its preimage under S should also have density zero. So this is a rigorous formulation of the, the thinking that if you force S into a small set, then the input value is also forced into a small set. Okay. So they made this conjecture, and they show that if you do assume this conjecture, then yes, you can prove this Erdős theorem in reverse. And actually, they proved a much stronger result. So this result says is a lot like the theorems we've been discussing, but instead of just looking at the first iterate of, of n under s, you look at the first capital K iterates. So they said if you fix any epsilon greater than zero, fix any non-negative integer K, then for almost all n, the the abundancy of the first k iterates of n under s is at least about the abundancy of n, and the abundancy of the first k iterates under s is at most about the abundancy of n. Okay, so remember, it was the second one that uh, was causing us trouble, even when capital K is one. So you can think of this theorem as saying that, at least conditionally on this conjecture, abundancy generally persists under any finite number of iterations of s, any bounded finite number of iterations of s. So I should say, actually, just to be completely honest, the lower bound half, this was the part we didn't have any trouble with when k was one. Erdős actually proved this in 1976 unconditionally. He didn't need the conjecture. So the lower bound part you can actually handle without the conjecture. The upper bound part is where you need the conjecture, just as we were saying, this Erdős in reverse. But actually, if you really are interested in just the case k equals one, which is the case we were discussing before, you can do it unconditionally. It's, it's, there's kind of an ad hoc argument that works in that one case. But to do the higher values of capital K, it really seems you need, need to assume something. Okay. So, yeah, the first new thing I want to talk about, or the first recent results I want to talk about, are results toward this EGPS conjecture. So if you have a set of density zero, do you really, can you really say that the inverse image under S has density zero? So, Maybe not surprisingly, for density zero sets A that have a certain amount of arithmetic structure, it's not so hard. So you can actually, it's, it's at least tractable to, to prove this in certain special cases. So there's a theorem of, from a few years ago of mine that if you count how often S of n is prime, then actually the number of n up to x for which S of n is prime is big O of x over log x. So certainly the inverse image of the primes under S has density zero. Conjecturally, the number of n up to x, which s of n is prime, should be asymptotically x over log x. Uh, maybe it's a little surprising that I'm not claiming any constant in front of that. I'm claiming the constant one, but that's my conjecture. And one can prove big O of x over log x. So that's an instance where we know the EGPS conjecture. Of course, a very, very special case. Here's another theorem, which is a confirming instance of the EGPS conjecture. So if you look at the normal number of prime factors of s of n, that uh, is log log n. So normal order here is met in the sense of Hardy and Wright. And one way of saying this is if you look at omega of s of n, that's asymptotic to log log n as n goes to infinity on a sequence of n of density one. Okay. And you can think of that as a confirming instance of the EGPS conjecture for these sets a epsilon. These are numbers which have very far from the expected number of prime factors. Okay, so we know some confirming instances of this conjecture in very, very special cases. There are, there are many other special cases, but I'm just highlighting these two. There's another way of looking at the conjecture which is interesting. So if you start with a set A, you could apply S to A and then apply S inverse. And of course, after you do this, what you get back will contain A. So A is contained with an S inverse of S of A. And so if you believe the EGPS conjecture, then, well, whenever what's inside the S inverse has density zero, then A better have density zero. Or if you turn it around, if A doesn't have density zero, then S of A better not have density zero. So the EGPS conjecture would imply that if you start with a set that doesn't have density zero, and you apply this function S to it, you should also get out a set that doesn't have density zero. And you could ask, well, do we know that in many cases? So the very first case, the most natural thing is, okay, let's just take A to be all of the positive integers. Do we know that if you apply S to all the positive integers that you don't get something with density zero? 
So that's not even completely obvious if you haven't seen it before, but one thing you realize is that actually you can prove that there are lots of, of elements in the image of S by this trick. So if you just look at S of a product of two primes, P and Q, then you get P plus Q plus one, if the primes are distinct. And then you realize, well, we know actually that almost all even numbers can be written as a sum of two distinct primes. In fact, in many ways, as a sum of two distinct primes. And so you get that almost all odd numbers can be written as P plus Q plus one. So almost all odd numbers are in the image of S. So actually, this weak consequence of the EGPS conjecture that a set that doesn't have density zero has an image under S that doesn't have density zero, we know that for the full set of positive integers, for example, by this argument. But even sets which you might not think would be much more complicated, it, it gets to be a pretty hard problem pretty soon. So suppose you start just with a set of even integers. You could ask, is it true that if you look at the image of the even integers under S, that that set is not a set of density zero? And that's hard. So this was only shown a couple of years ago by Florian Luca and Carl Pomerantz. So the image of the even numbers under S is actually a set of, well, they prove positive lower density. Okay, and well, I'll leave you to think about it. It's not completely obvious, but this is equivalent to proving that a positive proportion of even numbers are in the range of S. Okay, so the first new result I, I want to talk about is, uh, this is work in progress with uh, Lola and Carl. So we prove a weak form of the EGPS conjecture. So this is a substantially weak inversion, but uh, still has some interesting consequences. So here's our theorem. Let me let epsilon of x be any positive valued function that tends to zero as x goes to infinity. So it can tend to zero as slowly as you like, but it should, needs to tend to zero. If you take any collection of integers, which has, well, I allow a little bit more than x to the half integers. I allow x to the half plus epsilon of x integers. Then if you look at the number of n up to x for which s of n lies in that set, that is little o of x as x goes to infinity. So in particular, if you start with an infinite set of integers whose counting function is not only little o of x, but just grows a little bit faster than x to the half, then the EGPS conjecture is true for that set. It's pre-image under S has density zero. And the proof borrows ideas from a recent earlier work of Carl and also from a recent preprint of Andy Booker. So Andy Booker has this nice result that the number of pre-images of an even number under S is no more than about the square root of n. And if you actually just apply his proof kind of directly to the situation we're interested in, you would get more or less this theorem, but without the plus epsilon of x, you'd have to take away a small epsilon. So the sort of innovation in our result is going from a minus epsilon to a plus epsilon of x. And that's one way of thinking about the innovation in our result. Uh, okay, so I won't say too much about the proof of this because I think uh, there are some hairy details which I think are particularly nasty to try and follow in real time on a slide. So I'm just gonna talk about kind of the setup and then if you really are interested in the details, they are on my slides but I'm not going to, to torture you with them now. So uh, the slides will be posted and you can look, look at them then. But I will just tell you the initial setup and then what we use this setup to prove and then, uh, well then I'll move on. So the first thing is, uh, we actually, it's convenient in our proof to, to assume some lower bound on epsilon of x. And you can do that because actually if you think about what we're proving, we're proving something for sets of size x to the half plus epsilon of x. So if you can do it for a larger value of epsilon of x, that's better. So the theorem only gets stronger if you prove it for larger values of epsilon of x. So you may as well assume epsilon of x is at least one over log log x. And the reason for doing that is just because well, this factor by which you exceed x to the half is x to the epsilon of x. If you choose epsilon of x to be this large, then that will exceed any power of log x. And that's just a little bit useful uh, for reasons which I guess I'll suppress anyway, but it is useful in the end. So let me let a now be a set of integers within most x to the half plus epsilon of x elements. And then I wanna count how many n's up to x land in a after I apply s. And the first thing I'm going to do is a trick that Erdős did all the time, which is, well, I'm not gonna count all ends with this property. I'm gonna immediately discard a set of ends that I don't like, a set of ends that I don't know how to control. 
And here are the inconvenient n that we discard in our proof. So we first discard all n up to x to the half. Well, this is harmless because we're trying to prove a bound of little o of x, and so there are certainly little o of x integers up to x to the half. So it's harmless to just forget about those. I can discard all n which have no prime factor up to log x for the same reason, because by the sieve, those n have size, the number of those n is of size little o of x. I can discard n with a large square full part, again, because it's well known the numbers with a large square full part, as long as the part goes to infinity, that size is little o of x. And then there are a couple of slightly more unusual conditions. So you can actually discard all n with the GCD of n and sigma of n bigger than log x. So this is maybe not as well known, but this is in a, in a paper of Erdős. He in fact shows that the counting function of n's with GCD of n sigma of n greater than, well, say the number of n up to x with GCD n sigma of n greater than log x is smaller than x over some small power of log x. So in particular, it's the low of x, so we can assume that. And then here is the key condition. This is what gives us the savings. We take advantage of the fact that there are not very many n up to x which have a divisor very close to x to the half. So we can discard n's with a divisor between x to the half minus 10 epsilon of x and x to the half plus 10 epsilon of x. Okay, so we use this, this work. So this, this theorem is essentially due to Erdős, though there are refinements of it later due to people like Tenenbaum and Ford. So we throw out little o of x integers each time and we're only trying to prove a bound of little o of x, so this is okay. And then what we do is we just prove a pointwise bound on the number of preimages, on the number of remaining preimages for every single element in, in capital A. So for every single element in the set capital A, we prove that the number of n up to x that are remaining that, that haven't been thrown out yet, for which s of n is little a, is a, is a lot smaller than x to the half, is at most x to the half minus two epsilon of x. Well, since the size of A was in most x to the half plus epsilon of x, and this is a, a bound on the number of preimages for each element in A, uh, I just multiply them together and I complete the proof that the number of preimages of A is the low of x, the number of preimages up to x. Okay. So, yeah, so you can look in these slides and see exactly what we do, but I won't talk about that now. <laughs> okay. So there's something else that we noticed which uh, seems somewhat interesting. So if you look in this EGPS paper when they're discussing this, this uh, conjecture about pre-images of sets of density zero having density zero, they propose a hypothesis. So here's the hypothesis. For each fixed K, the number of pre-images of a number N under S the number of preimages not exceeding k times n should be bounded by a constant depending only on k. Okay, so I'm looking at preimages of n, but I'm only looking at small preimages, preimages not exceeding a constant times n, and the claim is that the number of such is uniformly bounded depending only on that constant. So let me make a couple of remarks about this hypothesis. The first is you might think it's, it's a little bit unnatural to act only count preimages not exceeding a constant multiple of n. Why not count just all the preimages of n? Well, if you just count all the preimages of n, then it's easy to see that, that the number of preimages of n can be unbounded, and we've essentially already seen that because if you take an n for which n minus one has many representations as a sum of two primes, so we know now that that's true for almost all even numbers. Almost all even numbers have many representations as a sum of two primes. Then n will have many representations as an s value because s of p q will be n. Okay, so you couldn't hope for this hypothesis to be true without putting a restriction on the size of the preimage. And well, you can easily convince yourself that once we have this restriction, this construction doesn't disprove the hypothesis. So we get many preimages of the form p q but only big O one of the preimages we constructed actually satisfy this condition that they're less than kn, so it's okay. So this is an interesting hypothesis. The reason they propose it is it's not too hard to show that if this hypothesis were true, then the EGPS conjecture would be true. So this is something that would imply the EGPS conjecture. Now they, I noticed I was careful to not call this a conjecture because they don't call it a conjecture in their paper, they call it a, a hypothesis and they say we're not sure we believe this hypothesis. And in fact, it may be possible to disprove it. We note though that it implies the conjecture. And in fact, it is possible to disprove it. So I just wanna quickly tell you uh, 
uh, our disproof of the conjecture, uh, if I suppress details, the, the outline fits in one slide. So we'll show that actually there are many numbers M which have arbitrarily many pre-images of the form 2PQ, where P and Q are distinct odd primes. So remember the construction we had before, we were just looking at S of PQ. Now I'm gonna look at S of 2PQ. Okay, so if I get an M which has many pre-images of the form 2PQ, well one thing to note is that if I take any one of these pre-images 2PQ, S of 2PQ, which I'm supposing is M, S of 2PQ is certainly at least as big as PQ because PQ is a proper divisor of 2PQ. And so if you look at this, this says that the pre-image which is 2PQ is at most 2M. So I'm constructing a number M which has many pre-images less than twice its size. Well, you're not supposed to be able to do that if you believe that hypothesis. So if you can construct M which have arbitrarily many pre-images of the form 2PQ, then you've disproved the conjecture. And now you just compute what is S of 2PQ? Well, you notice that it can be factored as P plus three times Q plus three minus six. So this is just a, an algebra exercise to compute S of 2PQ and do this factorization. And then, well, you'll get many, you'll get numbers which have arbitrarily many representations. If you can find integers that have arbitrarily many representations of this product of two shifted primes, P plus three times Q plus three. So if there are numbers which can be written in arbitrarily many ways as P plus three times Q plus three, you win and you can do that. So this was something that Erdős noted uh, in 1936 in the case of P minus one and Q minus one. He constructed numbers which had many representations as a product like that and we're able to do this for, well we adapt the construction to work with other, other shifted prime variants. Okay. So you can push this a little further. I'll just mention uh, one, one thing we prove in our paper. So uh, fix an alpha greater than zero, fix an epsilon greater than zero, then there are infinitely many numbers n where the fiber of n, S inverse of n, actually has arbitrarily many pre-images that are all of size roughly alpha n. Are you, well, I'm not claiming all of the pre-images are of size roughly alpha n, but if you just look at the pre-images that are of size alpha n, there can be arbitrarily many of those. And what do I mean by arbitrarily many? Well, you can quantify it. In fact, you can get as many as n to this power, constant over log log n. Okay. So now I'm coming up to the last section of my talk. And in this last section, I'd like to revisit a theorem of Davenport that came up earlier. So this was the theorem that said, okay, form this set script D sub S of U by looking at all ends with S of N over N below the given bound U, then this set possesses an asymptotic density and the density function is continuous, the value at zero is zero, the value at infinity is one. Okay. So if you haven't seen this sort of thing before, then it might seem like this is kind of a, a strange isolated result, but there's actually quite a framework for these results, so I'll recall it for the people who haven't seen it. So I'm gonna define a function f from the reals to zero, one. I'm gonna call that a distribution function if it has the following three properties. So I'm going to insist that it's non-decreasing, that it's right continuous, and that as u goes to minus infinity, the value of the function should go to zero. As u goes to plus infinity, the value of the function should go to one. So this is what I'll call a distribution function. And distribution functions arise naturally in probability. So if you take any re real valued random variable on your favorite probability space, then you get a distribution function just by asking what's the probability that that random variable is below a point t. You call that capital F of t, you get a distribution function. And then conversely, every distribution function actually arises this way for some choice of probability space and some random variable on the space. So distribution functions are, are just very natural objects from this point of view of probability. How do they enter into arithmetic? Well, you can make the following definition, which is motivated by pretending that the natural numbers are a probability space with density as a probability measure. So you can pretend that that's true, and you can say that an arithmetic function, a real valued arithmetic function little f, is associated to the distribution function capital F if capital F of t is the density of n with little f of n and most t. And well, you might think I should require this for all t, but for technical reasons, we only require this for every t at which f is continuous. So this is what it means for a real valued arithmetic function to have a distribution function. It means there's some distribution function capital F, so the capital F of t is the density of n with little f of n and most t for every real t where capital F is continuous. 
Of course, if capital F is continuous everywhere, then this is true for every realty. And well, Davenport's theorem then fits, fits naturally into this larger context. It says precisely that the function S of n over n has a continuous distribution function. So that is Davenport's theorem. And now you won't be surprised that Davenport actually proved this for sigma of n over n, not S of n over n. It's a bit better behaved because it's multiplicative, but the two are equivalent because this, they just differ by the constant number one. So if you prove it for sigma of n over n, you've really proved it for S of n over n. Okay. So, well, I've rephrased what Davenport proved, but I still haven't really put it into a larger context. But there is a beautiful theorem of Erdős and Vintner from the mid 40s which does that. So, Erdős and Vintner in the mid 40s actually classified which real valued additive functions have a distribution function. And what they proved is that a real valued additive function possesses a distribution function if and only if the following three series all converge. Okay, so I won't talk about uh, the sums here because they're not going to be important in, in what follows, but this is the necessary and sufficient condition for F to have a distribution function. These three series all have to converge. Moreover, they also completely classified when the distribution function is continuous. So the distribution function is continuous, well, unless something very, very pathological happens. So how could the distribution function not be continuous? Well, the only way the distribution function cannot be continuous is if at every prime, f of p is zero, except for a very sparse set of primes. A very sparse set of primes means a set of primes where the sum of the reciprocals actually converges. So they showed that the distribution function is continuous unless f vanishes on almost all primes. The set of primes where f doesn't vanish should have convergent reciprocal sum. Okay, so there's not very much about this theorem that I think anyone would claim is obvious. But I'll say that the, the last part, the bit about continuity, if it really is true that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes in which f of p is not zero converges, then it's actually easy to see that the distribution function won't be continuous. So you can see one direction of this, this necessary and sufficient condition for continuity because if, the sum, if that sum is really convergent, then a positive proportion of integers will not be divisible by any prime with f of p not zero and will also be square free. So you can force, you can actually count that the integers which are not divisible by any prime with f of p not zero, which are square free, you'll find that that makes up a positive density set. And then f on any of those integers will just be zero because it's an additive function and f of every prime dividing the number is zero. And so you'll get this jump continuity of the distribution function at zero. Okay. And yeah, well, I said that this puts Davenport in a larger context. Of course, sigma of n over n is not an additive function, but you just take the logarithm. And you recover Davenport's theorem immediately from this. Okay. So what is it that I want to uh, say in the last few minutes of this talk? Well, I want to discuss what happens if you combine additive functions. So we were talking about if you have a single additive function, then we know exactly when it has a distribution function. But let's suppose you have k additive functions, f1 through fk, and you want to somehow form a new function from those, and you want to still ask, does it have a distribution function? So maybe the most natural thing you could do is let me take some real polynomial in k variables and plug f1 through fk into that polynomial. And I'll ask, does p of f1 through fk possess a distribution function? So it turns out, and uh, I can talk with you later about this if you want. It turns out there's a simple argument that's been known for a while, although I don't know if it's been written down, that the answer is, is yes. So it's not so hard to prove that if you take any additive functions, all of which possess distribution functions, you plug them into your favorite polynomial, it will still possess a distribution function. But suppose we're interested not just in distribution functions, but in continuous distribution functions. Is it still true if you take your favorite functions f1 through fk, which have continuous distribution functions, plug them into your favorite polynomial, does the result always have a continuous distribution function? I just told you it will certainly have a distribution function. Is it continuous? Here the answer is no. And it's not so hard to see because just let's take the simple polynomial p of xy equals x plus y. So I'm here, I'm just looking at a sum of two, two additive functions. Then if I take my favorite function f with a continuous distribution function, minus f will also have a continuous distribution function, but if I add f and minus f, I'll get zero. And that certainly does not have a continuous distribution function. So you certainly can't hope for the answer to the second question to be yes without further conditions. Okay, 
So, well, of course, we don't just want to give up. We want to know, okay, so the answer is not in general yes, but what can you say? So you can actually understand this question pretty well in one very, very simple case. If P is linear, then you plug in a bunch of additive functions into a linear polynomial, well, a linear combination of additive functions is just an additive function. And then, well, maybe P has a constant term, so you have an additive function plus a constant. But you can read off, if you have a, plug a linear, if you plug additive functions into a linear polynomial, you just get another additive function up to this constant. And so you can see when that has a continuous distribution function just by that criterion I told you before in the erdos vintner theorem. So actually for linear polynomials, you can completely understand when a linear combination of additive functions has a continuous, has a continuous distribution function. So the main result that uh, is proved with a graduate student at UGA is actually the linear polynomials really provide the only essential obstruction. So what's the theorem? So I should say this is, maybe there should be a little t like some people have been using because this is not written up yet, this is work in progress, but this is the theorem I think we've proved. So this is joint with Noah Leibowitz Lockhart who's a graduate student at the University of Georgia. So let's take f1 through fk to be additive functions. And let me suppose that there's no linear obstruction to, to continuity of the distribution function. So by that I mean, let's suppose that if you take any R linear combination of F1 through FK, except the stupid linear combination, so you're not allowed to take all the C's to be zero, let's suppose that that has a continuous distribution function. Then what we show is that if you take any non-constant polynomial whatsoever, then if you plug F1 through FK into that, that will have a continuous distribution function. So if you, and I should mention this hypothesis, well, this hypothesis is not so hard to check in concrete cases just because, uh, again, we know exactly when additive functions possess continuous distribution functions. Okay, so this is our theorem that the linear case is the, where there are counterexamples are sort of the only source of counterexamples in this sense. Okay. So let me mention also one thing you can get from this. So here's a corollary, which maybe at first doesn't look like it should be a corollary, but is a corollary. So let's suppose I take any collection of additive functions, all of which possess a continuous distribution function, then we show that the product F1 through FK also possesses a continuous distribution function. So if you multiply any, any finite number of additive functions with continuous distribution functions, their product possesses a continuous distribution function. So of course the conclusion looks like the conclusion of the theorem here with the polynomial P of X1 through XK just being X1, X2 up through XK. But the point of the corollary is I don't, I don't assume this, uh, this condition at the beginning. I, I allow there to be some, some R linear combination that doesn't have a continuous distribution function, but you can still show that even in that case, the product possesses a continuous distribution function. Okay. So in the interest of time, I won't, won't say too much about this proof, but again, you can read about it on the slide. Okay, so I wanna conclude this talk with just a couple of footnotes. So we were looking at polynomials and additive functions and asking, do you get a continuous distribution function there? You could also take your favorite multiplicative functions and ask, okay, if I plug them into a polynomial function, do I get a continuous distribution function? Well, a polynomial and a bunch of multiplicative functions is really just the same as a linear combination of multiplicative functions because the product of multiplicative functions is already multiplicative. So really, it's the same question as asking, what if you just look at a linear combination of multiplicative functions? And by a variant of the method, no one I can handle many of these two. So this is just some crazy example of something that we can do with the method. Uh, so this, this crazy thing does have a continuous distribution function. And then, well, there's another direction in which you could take this, which is, well, there are lots of very interesting additive functions which don't have distribution functions in the sense I defined. For example, the this function little omega of n, which shows up everywhere, this doesn't have a distribution function in my sense, but if you subtract log log n and divide by root log log n, then you get the normal distribution. That's the erdos katz theorem. So you could also ask, well, what if I take, take additive functions which satisfy something like erdos katz and plug them into a polynomial, do I get an erdos katz theorem for the result? And Greg Martin and Lee Troop have results in this direction. So you can ask them about that. So I will end here and just say thank you for your attention.
questions for Paul? Carl. I had a question about the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So you have this counterexample for the case capital K equals 2. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering if there is a smaller range, say if K is near 1 or 1 and a half, is there any sort of refinement? Yeah, so we could have, I should have emphasized this, but actually uh, this theorem here, the way we prove this theorem shows that no such refinement, uh, or so no, you can't, there's no value of K for which this is true. Yes, so there are results like that that are known. And can you deduce your polynomial results and things like that? So that's not the way we do it. I don't know how to deduce it from those results I've seen. Uh, I mean, the, the existence of the distribution function you could deduce from the, that, but the continuity, I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Okay, well, let's thank Paul again.